sadists. In some cases, the faces are familiar, others are better known by the nicknames given to them by the press. But many of them you will never have heard of. This series will shine a light on the dark world of some of these killers. The subject of tonight's program is a man who committed murders almost 30 years apart. Looking at the injuries, the poor man had been tortured. A man who used knives to deadly effect. A large carving type knife was through his chest into the door. And who targeted elderly, vulnerable men. Anybody who could look after themselves, he, he wouldn't take them on. After a life sentence, Andrew Dawson turned himself around but it wouldn't last. There was evidence of a struggle. There was evidence of an attack. Mr Hancock had uh, been murdered, brutally murdered. Dawson killed twice, and it could have been more. He put his arm under my neck there and left me up. And I just everybody keeps saying, oh, you're very lucky, Alan. Perhaps I was lucky. There will be no more second chances. For Andrew Dawson, life will mean life. I know he's known as a serial killer now, and he, he should be in there until he rots. These are Andrew Dawson's last moments of freedom. Surrounded by police officers in the seaside town of Whitehaven, he makes one final attempt to escape their grasp by diving into the sea. Dawson is a man on the run, suspected of a violent double murder. Both his victims were found 200 miles away in Derby. They had been stabbed numerous times and placed in a bathtub filled with bleach. Police tasered the suspect before placing him under arrest. But Andrew Dawson's story begins much earlier. This wasn't the first time he had been held for murder. Eighty miles northwest of Derby lies the town of Ormskirk. A usually quiet, peaceful place, it springs into life on market day as visitors flood in from neighboring towns. But on a Friday morning in August 1981, the calm was shattered when police inspector Jim Kay received an urgent call out. I was travelling along Stanley Street when a call came over the radio to say that a gentleman at a shop had not been seen for a day and the back door and the back gate were open. The 999 call raised concern for Henry Walsh, an elderly shopkeeper who lived above his premises in the town centre. He hadn't been seen since the market was held the previous day. I knew the man, I'd spoken to him on occasions, he used to stand at the door and talk to people as they went past. Obviously in his 90s, and he seemed to run the business in a time warp. It's as though it was a business from the, the 1950s that hadn't really moved forward into the 60s and 70s. With reports of a possible break-in, Inspector Kay went with a colleague to investigate. We walked along the entry, through the back gate, into the back of the building. We then went across the kitchen and saw at the bottom of the stairs the body of a man. It quickly became clear that the old man hadn't passed away peacefully. He was hanging from a series of coat hangers on the door. He'd obviously been placed there by someone. It wasn't a natural position, not a position he could have got into himself. He'd obviously been hung by the back of his clothing onto the door. And that wasn't all. On closer inspection, it was obvious that Henry Walsh had been violently attacked. Someone had stabbed him several times in the body. And in fact, a knife was through his chest, a large carving-type knife. It was straight through his chest into the door. The shop was now a crime scene and Inspector Kay called in Lancashire's murder squad. One of the officers was Eric Whitehead. 
it was a scene of extreme violence. You're thinking to yourself, well, you know, what on earth's gone on here? Who's done this? There's all kinds of different thoughts racing through your mind. With no immediate clues as to who the murderer was, the team explored possible motives. Robbery was suspected. Now, who would pick on this place? It was like going back 50, 60 years in time. And you're thinking, well, what sort of man is going to be on these premises? Nothing I would have suggested. But the injuries indicated the shopkeeper had been killed for money. The poor man had been tortured. They reminded Williams as though someone had said, where's your money, where's your money, where's your money? And kept stabbing him with a knife. Not deeply, just chest wounds. The scene was cordoned off, and investigators scoured it for any clues the killer might have left behind. But the presence of police officers caught the attention of local journalist Clifford Birchall. I noticed at the end of Moore Street there was police activity, some tapes and police officers in places where they wouldn't normally be. Um, so, as is the case with reporters, you went along to see what was happening and uh, I immediately contacted a photographer who came out and took some shots of the, of the scene. Clifford prepared a report for the local paper, but initially police were keeping tight-lipped about the gruesome details. The police did admit that he had been stabbed. They didn't tell us that there had been uh, a ligature tied around his neck or the fact that uh, his, his jaw had been fractured. Whoever had killed Henry Walsh was capable of extreme violence. Kerry Danes is a forensic psychologist. She studies killers and what motivates them to commit their crimes. The police could have been forgiven for thinking that they were dealing with a psychopath here because although the offence wasn't planned, certainly the murder wasn't committed in the heat or panic of being caught. This is somebody who is capable of instrumental violence, extreme instrumental violence. He's got a callous lack of empathy for the vulnerable in society. Several days after the murder, police were no further forward in catching the offender and the local community was getting worried. People were, were very shocked by it. You know, murders didn't happen every day um, or even every year. And I think it was the fact that he was such a lovely old man, his age, people just couldn't believe that somebody would do something like that. It was a complete mystery because this isn't a violent town. This is a normal market town. Murders do happen occasionally, but this was out of place for the area. A post-mortem revealed the killer had struck on market day, the day before Mr. Walsh's body was found. It meant the list of possible suspects was much, much longer. Most of the people that are in Omskirk on market day are people from outside. You don't know who they are, you don't know where they come from. It's no idea at all. It's, um... From a police point of view, logistically, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so an appeal was placed in the newspaper, asking the public to come forward with any useful information. The police would appeal for witnesses and we would try and help, help that. They wouldn't necessarily be able to identify everybody who had been passed uh, on that day, so we could reach those uh, for them. So a lot of local people came forward with different ideas and what might have happened, what might not have happened, and maybe they, they had some theories as to who it might be. Amongst the calls and tip-offs was some information about a local teenager. His name was Andrew Dawson. We received information about Mr Dawson being seen in a local public house about 200, 300 yards away from the, away from the shop spending an awful lot of money in the fruit machines. Well, Andrew never had any cash. Andrew Dawson was always broke. So if somebody tells you that Andrew Dawson's been in with a lot of money, your first question is, come on, Andrew, where have you got it from? So immediately, he comes into the picture, doesn't he? But even with a pocket full of money, Andrew Dawson's background didn't fit with such a violent crime. If somebody came to me and said, right, OK, who are your suspects? Andrew wouldn't have been on the list. Not on mine, anyway. He was a, a petty, petty thief, 
small time criminal, general nuisance about the town, but you would never have envisaged at that stage that he would have done something like this. He was born in the town and he grew up in the town and he was just part of the local teenage scene. For want of a better expression, teenage job. He was a petty criminal. No more than that. Or never gave us any reason to suspect he was any more than that. Being spotted 200 yards from the crime scene and with little else for police to go on, Andrew Dawson became the prime suspect. So what could have turned a teenage tearaway into a violent, ruthless killer? I always said he would kill. He would actually kill, because he, he, he had no compassion for anybody. He wouldn't bother him in the least. In 1981, in the Lancashire town of Ormskirk, police are investigating the brutal murder of 91-year-old Henry Walsh. His body had been found hanging on the back of a door inside his shop, after what appeared to be a violent robbery. He'd been stabbed many times. His jaw had been broken and a ligature tied around his neck. Chief suspect was Andrew Dawson. A local 18-year-old spotted close to the murder scene shortly afterwards, spending large sums of money. Dawson was known to police, but didn't stand out as a particularly dangerous young offender. I mean, he was brash, he was arrogant, he was, um, you know, I suppose you could describe him amongst his peers as a bit of a bully, but, you know, just a teenage job. Every town's got them, every town's full of them. Dawson had grown up in Ormskirk, one of six children brought up in a typical working-class family. One of his brothers was Mally Dawson. We were all brought up with the same treatment uh, because my dad was a proper Victorian strict father. I mean, he didn't think nothing about uh, giving you a slap. For something. And I mean, a good backhanded one. He was like, you always did as you were told. Despite the strict regime, the brothers clashed over almost anything. We were always arguing and squabbling over stupid little things, like, what are you doing when you've got half a round of bread more than me? Think, things like that. With six children, money was tight. We never had a, a full week's holiday anywhere. We couldn't afford that. Just days out, and we all got ex exactly the same treatment. It was like, right, uh, yeah, here's the ice creams. Uh, uh, always took sandwiches and drinks with us, but always, because we could never afford to go into a cafe or anything like that. But from an early age, Andrew had different ideas about earning a living. I can remember Andy... Oh, he was only six or seven years old in junior school. And he, he, he saw some little kid, I think it was a little girl, she had two or three pennies on her, and he decided to nick it off her, shoved her over and nicked some money and decided, I'm running shop and spending it. Dawson was reckless and antisocial from a very early age. Now, to be fair, many people go through that stage, the stage of juvenile delinquency, but then they grow out of it. But for a small proportion of people, they don't, and their crimes escalate. And as Andrew got older, his taste for other people's money grew stronger. When he got to about eight or nine is when he got really annoying, because he'd got the idea of if he wanted it, he'd just go and get it. Uh, it, it, he wanted to pinch it, he'd pinch it. He'd go robbing anybody on the estate where we were. As a teenager, Dawson started to experiment with illegal drugs. The kids he was hanging around with, they were always into, oh, magic mushrooms. And then he decides, well, I know, let's see what glue's like. By this time, he was getting tattoos done himself and his mates with the engine ink and the needle. And when he started stealing from his own brother, it was the last straw. That thieving little sods had a way with money. But I'd worked hard for that money, <laughs> and this thieving sod. So I got a grip of him, and in the, in the end, he admitted it. So I got the police onto him. With that and him bunking off school all the time, he ended up going to court, and he got six months in Boston. The law had caught up with Andrew Dawson, but instead of rehabilitating a wayward teenager, the spell in Boston increased his appetite to commit crime. Being sent to a ball stall can really affect you in one of two ways. For many, it's a very effective deterrent, and they don't want to end up there again in the future. But for others, it's just a school for them to learn how to be criminals. 
once he'd been into Borstal, it, that's where it went worse, and he must have realised, oh, right, if I want anything, I'm going to go on the rob for it. His next target was an old man robbed on his doorstep. A pattern was beginning to emerge. Anybody who's able to look after themselves, he won't challenge them. Vulnerable, elderly, once he knows he can get away with giving her a good eye, he will do. Anybody who could look after themselves, he, he wouldn't take them on. As the criminality spiralled, so too did the drug taking, and soon Dawson was hooked on cannabis. He could go on it for a good 48 hours non-stop. I mean, wide awake all the time. He could be smoking dope all the time and he'd stay with... But then, once you haven't got some, you get to the paranoid stage where you think even people across the road are talking about you and you start getting panicky over things. So he's got to have the drugs again. Dawson got involved with drug use from a very early age. He was smoking cannabis from the age of 14 quite heavily. Now, we know that people who are involved in cannabis use are actually 16 times more likely to be involved in a violent offence. By now, Dawson was 18 years old. He was hooked on drink and drugs and had a taste for violence. His growing criminal record included time in Borstal. Now... He was in the frame for a brutal murder after being spotted spending money in the pubs near the crime scene. He's picked his day, hasn't he? Market day. The town absolutely full, jump out full of strangers. I mean, the chances of him being caught, I suppose in his mind, were minimal. Whereas in actual fact, he was leaving great big footprints wherever he went. Police discovered that Andrew Dawson had cashed a pension buck belonging to Henry Walsh in the town. Everything pointed towards Dawson. And seven days after the murder, police swooped to arrest him. The local yob who detectives had dismissed for such a brutal crime quickly confessed. Those close to the case had their own theories. I on whatever he was eye on. Oh, I've run out of money. I know, I'll go and get some. I'll go for an easy target, that old fella's shop. That's what's been in his mind. Now, you don't do something like that. I mean, the fellow was 91, for God's sake. He knew who he was. All he had to do was push him out the way. He didn't have to kill the old fella. He probably had one thing on his mind. He probably thought, well, you know, I want some money. I desperately need some money. Whether he wanted it for drink, whether he wanted it for drugs, whether he wanted it for gambling, whatever the motive, whatever the driving factor behind what he did, um, that was it. I think he was probably covering his tracks in many ways. Once he got the money... He didn't need the man anymore. Well, I always said he, he would kill. He would actually kill, because he, he, he had no compassion for, for anybody. It wouldn't bother him in the least. Finally, the people of Ormskirk could rest easy, as a dangerous killer was taken off the streets. Dawson appeared at Preston Crown Court to be sentenced. Clifford Birchall, who was the first to break the story, would now report on Dawson's fate. The judge paid particular attention in his sentencing uh, to what he said was his uh, acknowledgement of the fact that he was remorseful. I mean, he did highlight the, the phrase he had given when he was charged with, I wish it was me, not him. I could see by his face there was no remorse, no nothing. You could actually just look at him and think, there's nothing there. And you'll never hear him say, I'm sorry for killing him. He said, I, I, I just wish it was me. Right, you get in life and that's it. The younger you are when you commit your first violent offence, the more likely you are to commit other violent offences in the future. So Dawson's already high risk by virtue of the fact that he's killed somebody at the tender age of 18. But when you look at the specifics of that offence, then he becomes even more dangerous. He certainly didn't need to kill the old man. There wasn't anything he really gained from that other than possibly avoiding being identified by the victim in the future. But he certainly didn't need to torture and taunt him in the way that he did. To do that for such little gain shows a very peculiar mentality. Dawson was told he would serve a minimum of 14 years behind bars. But the impact on the community and the police officers involved would last much longer. It ranked up amongst um, some of the worst I've seen, yeah. Purely by the degree of violence, the reason for using the violence, the victim's age, his frailty, 
there was just no need for it at all. It was just, you know. At just 19 years of age, Andrew Dawson was a convicted killer. But few imagined he would one day be back in the dock, once again charged with murder. At 19 years of age, Andrew Dawson was beginning a life sentence for a vicious, unprovoked murder. His victim, 91-year-old shopkeeper Henry Walsh, had disturbed the teenager as he robbed his shop. But instead of fleeing the scene, Dawson had assaulted the old man, torturing him with a knife before plunging it into his chest and leaving him suspended on a wooden door. Police discovered that Dawson had been drinking and gambling in pubs near the scene and under arrest, he quickly confessed to the killing. Andrew Dawson had graduated from a school bully to petty thief and teenage job, and now he was a violent murderer. But a spell in adult prison would be a new experience for the young killer. Thoughts of Mr. Big Man. He goes in there at 18 years old, clean shaven, thinking, oh, I'm a, I'm a murderer, I can handle anybody. They come near me, said they're gonna get stabbed. No, I don't think so. I mean, you, you're a ten stone weekly. Prison brought Dawson face to face with some of the country's most feared criminals. He'd met uh, Sutcliffe. He said, oh, I was only a little wimp of a fella, that fella, you know. And then uh, Nielsen. He'd met him and he didn't think much of him neither. He wasn't impressed by them. He thought, like, say, they were nothing. He wanted to be better than them. In Dawson's mind, he's clearly a career criminal and he's got aspirations to be such and he compares himself to what he thinks of as the best of other notorious inmates. That's a very dangerous way of thinking for when he does come out of prison because it's not good to compare yourself to people who've committed really quite heinous acts. Andrew Dawson served 17 years for Walsh's murder. He passed various courses and trained for employment on the outside world. And in 1999, he was deemed ready to be released back into society. Dawson met a woman and moved to Derby to be with her. The new relationship quickly blossomed and children followed. And in 2000, the couple married at St. Mary's Church family had supported Andrew Dawson since his release and helped him to move on. On his wedding day, older brother Mally was at his side as best man. He got himself a job and then he knew he was getting a regular wage at the end of the week. He was fine with that because then he'd only go for a drink at the weekend and then he'd go back to work so he started living a normal life. Prison, it seemed, had done its job and Andrew Dawson had been rehabilitated. It's difficult for prisoners to adjust to life outside of prison, but he had employment, he had a relationship, and that provided him with the stability that he needed. He had clear routines, he worked during the week, and he drank at weekends. But if that safety net was taken away from him, things could start to unravel really very quickly. And things did start to unravel. Andrew Dawson fell back into his bad habits. His drinking increased and his behaviour deteriorated. His marriage started slowly going downhill because she was sick of him going out, getting drunk all the time and getting back into the drugs. Within three years of marrying, Dawson separated from his wife and his life was spiralling out of control. After one particularly heavy night in 2003, police arrested Dawson for being drunk and disorderly in Derby Town Centre. It broke the rules of his release, and Dawson was hauled back into jail. His time there was short-lived, and after six months, he was back on the outside, and back in trouble. At this point, Dawson's life has really descended into chaos. He's got family problems, he's got financial pressures, so he's under a lot of stress. When someone's under a lot of stress, their risk of committing further crimes increases. And it wouldn't be long before Dawson was back in trouble. He was caught sleeping rough in a local park and in possession of a knife. 
Now, he said to the police he'd forgot he had this knife on him. But part of his licence was, don't have any weapons. So he had to go back, back inside for 12 months. Andrew Dawson was treading a fine line, continually breaching the conditions of his freedom. With his marriage over and access to the children limited, Dawson was left alone to fend for himself. In 2010, he moved to a one-bedroom flat in the Derby suburb of Chadderston. Alan Cliff became his new neighbour. Well, the first time I met Andy, he was moving in downstairs. I think he asked me for a, a drink or something, or, or a smoke light, you know what I mean? He was a drinker. Liked his drink and he liked his smoke. That's, that's all I know about him. For several weeks, Alan kept an eye on the new arrival in the block. Just normal geezer, normal person, friendly, forward. I found he was very chatty. Did his own little thing, you know, he used to go out with his rucksack and then, then come back, that was it. Sometimes you couldn't even arguably catch him in. You know, if I knocked on his door, he, was, he wasn't in. So, really, like, he was, he was just, out, just a, a loner, really. Soon Dawson confided in his neighbour and told him about his past. He'd been in children's homes and he'd been in a, like, proof school. He'd done board stores and he'd done prison. And I thought, and then when he said he'd done life in prison, I couldn't... I thought, wait a minute. The more Alan learned, the more anxious he grew about his new acquaintance. I know I couldn't work him out, like, because it was just something, just something wrong with him. Just something, you know, something you just can't put your finger on. Just something that I couldn't get right with him. And on a Sunday night, six weeks after Dawson arrived, his behaviour became more sinister. He came up, he was, he was all agitated, he was all over the place. He had some beers, because he had knocked on the door, he said, oh, he said he was going to have a beer with me. So I let open the door and let him in. I said, there's something funny about you, mate. I said, you're on... You, you're a bit skittish, you know what I mean, like? And I was saying, you're, you're, you're a bit... What's up with you? He said, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. He said, I just want to... I just want to smoke like him. I said, well, I can't get you one. You know, I, was having, I think we had about two beers each. Alan's instincts were right. Before he knew it, Dawson suddenly became aggressive. He put his arm under my neck there and lifted me up. It was this arm here. I knew he was trying to get me into a, into a hold. You know what I mean? As soon as I felt that there, he tightened up. Because it was tight and I felt it there and I felt now then that will go back. So I've got up with him. I've got up with it because I felt that poor arm there, like, I mean, come up under my, under, my, under my neck. And I've got up with him. I've got his hand off and I've twisted him. I said, what the f are you, mate? And I think he was a bit shocked that, I, you know what I mean, that I, I got up and got him off me. I pulled him round the corner onto there and I said, listen, get out of my flat. Get out, go on, f out of my flat. And I've let him out. I've undone the door. I've undone the door. I said, go on, f off, mate, like, you know what I mean, not having that. But as soon as I locked shut the door, I said, what the f what, what was that all about, Alan? Alan never saw Andrew Dawson again, and he didn't report the incident. But downstairs, police were already on the scene. We were made aware that a body had been found uh, at a block of flats, and we were made aware that the police surgeon had attended, and the initial assessment was that it was a suicide. The body was that of John Dave Matthews, a 68-year-old man who lived alone in the block. Well, the body of Mr Matthews was found, was found in a full bath of bath water. He was fully clothed. He had been laying there for a number of days, which rendered the body at that point um, not a very pleasant sight for, for the officers and the police surgeon who attended. Neighbours were saddened by the news and surprised that Dave had taken his own life. Dave, lovely old fella. Um, didn't say anything, went to work every day, came back. It'd help you if you could. He's just one of those people like me. If he had it, he'd give it you. It was a, it was a lovely old geezer. <laughs> but the post-mortem held a surprise. Dave Matthews hadn't taken his own life at all. The findings were that there were multiple stab wounds to, to the body of Mr Matthews. Detective Constable John Flint was given the role of family liaison officer for Mr Matthews' relatives. It was very well thought of. He worked hard all his life, uh, kept himself to himself, was a friendly uh, old gentleman. The family were devastated because nobody ever expects that, that their father, mother or loved one has uh, died in such horrendous circumstances, really. 
Somebody had murdered Dave Matthews and then placed his body in a bath of water and bleach. And whoever it was had left little evidence. The flat was very clean and tidy. So at that point, there was no obvious signs that there'd been a struggle um, and that a murder had taken place. Whoever had cleaned that flat must have been forensically aware uh, what we would be looking for. Well, this is a pre-planned offence against a vulnerable old man by somebody who's clearly very forensically aware because they've taken an awful lot of care to cover their tracks. So very likely not a fledgling killer. But the most scary thing about it is that it's seemingly completely without motive. While forensic work continued, police focused their attention on the other residents in the building. The block of flats is designed as such that uh, entry is, is gained by a fob. It was, just, it was just a theory that we had, that whoever had carried out this murder was fully aware of uh, how to get in and out and possibly could be very close. We quickly established uh, who was resident in the building and one name stood out, a gentleman by the name of Andrew Dawson. Dawson was immediately flagged up as a previous offender uh, and obviously had committed a previous murder. Police checked up on Dawson's convictions and discovered how he had repeatedly stabbed an elderly man to death. The suspicions were immediately erased uh, from that. We uh, sought to find Mr Dawson to see if he could throw any light on the situation, but uh, obviously he'd, uh, he'd left the scene uh, post-haste. Alan Cliff, who had been attacked by Dawson earlier in the week, was convinced police were onto the right man. I think it shocked everybody. Everybody thought there was still a killer out here. And I knew it was him. It had to be him. That was the only, you know, the only idiot, you know, it was the only one round here. Andrew Dawson was now the number one suspect. His flat was searched and various items seized. They suggested that he had gone on the run. We found evidence that he'd caught a, uh, caught a train to Sheffield and then an onward train to Ormskirk, I believe, where we knew he'd got, uh, where we'd got family members. It was nine o'clock. Robert De Niro film was just about to start and there's a knock at the door. Older brother Mally was about to get a surprise visit. Open the door, it's lashing it down with rain, and I was like, what do you want? I'm not expecting to see him. I let him in. He put his bag down by the door, comes in, sat there like this. You could see by his eyes, all glazed. Uh, and he's rolling himself a joint. Dawson was clearly agitated. He's going on about his wife and his kids and he can't see the kids anymore because his wife's had enough of him. And his stories were making little sense. He said, oh, uh, well, you remember a few years ago when I had to go back in for 12 months for carrying that knife? I went, yeah, what about it? He said, well, I think I'll be going away again for a bit. Oh, yeah, all right then. Dawson's drunken stories held little weight, but before Mally could find out more, he left, claiming to be going camping. And I looked at his feet, thinking, you've got shoes on, how can you go camping in this weather with shoes on? And he's lashing it down. With a head start on the chasing police, Dawson called in on other members of his family before making off again. Back in Derby, detectives were about to make another grim discovery. The decision was made to force entry to find an horrendous scene where Mr Hancock had uh, been murdered, brutally murdered. Police in Derby are investigating the vicious murder of pensioner Dave Matthews. The 68-year-old was found in his bath, having been stabbed to death. Prime suspect is his neighbour, Andrew Dawson, a 47-year-old with a deadly past. He'd committed his first murder in 1981, torturing an elderly shopkeeper to death. After spending 17 years behind bars, Dawson had been released and arrived in Derby. 
Now, he's on the run, and police have launched a manhunt. At the murder scene, door-to-door -door inquiries are underway. Police are trying to speak to neighbor Paul Hancock, but he's not answering the door. We were alerted to the fact that Miss Hancock hadn't been seen for several days, so the decision was made to force entry to Mr. Hancock's flat to find, again, a, a horrendous scene. Mr. Hancock had uh, been murdered, brutally murdered. Police now had two victims, both stabbed to death, in a single block of flats. The circumstances were very, very similar in, in as much as that the body was found, was found in the bath, fully clothed. But unlike Mr. Matthews' flat, there'd been no attempt to clean up. There was evidence of a struggle. There was evidence of an attack. Whoever had, had carried out the second murder had had to leave the scene very quickly. And police suspected that person was Andrew Dawson, a man with a previous conviction for murder. The fact that Mr Dawson hadn't been seen within the complex raised alarm bells. So it was imperative that we uh, spoke to Mr Dawson as quick as possible. Police had searched Dawson's sparse flat and seized a notebook. Although it was blank, forensic tests would reveal a vital clue. Examination of the notepad revealed indentations of previous writings and subject to forensic examination um, revealed a semi-confession, really, from Mr Dawson. He was obviously wrestling with his conscience at that stage as to what to do. The note admitted killing a man and placing his body in a bath. It also referred to a pink rose, which was placed on Mr. Matthews's bed, describing it as a nice touch. To find that rose on Mr. Matthews's pillow was quite a sinister turn, really. Uh, we, we didn't know what was in the mind of Mr. Dawson, uh, why he put it there, what, what he was trying to achieve, what he was trying to prove by placing it there. Uh, probably we'll never know to this day. The note was signed, the Angel of Mercy. But crucially, it was never sent to detectives. Well, whatever was he thinking at the point that he wrote this letter? Was it an attempt to engage the police in some kind of game? Was he having a crisis of conscience? Whatever his motivation might have been, he signed off as the Angel of Mercy. Well, that's putting a very palatable spin on what he'd done. He'd killed vulnerable old men in cold blood. He'd not euthanized them. Detectives pieced together what they believed had taken place in the flats. Dawson had been known to ask Dave Matthews to do his washing for him. Police suspected he had used this as a reason to call round, before stabbing his victim in the hallway. He had then taken his time to clear up the scene. Two weeks later, Dawson struck again as he paid a visit to neighbour Paul Hancock. Dawson again put his victim in a bath and filled it with water and bleach. Later he paid neighbour Alan Cliff a visit and tried unsuccessfully to strangle him. After a struggle, Dawson fled the block and got out of town. Well, looking back on that, I think, well, I was very lucky because he like, could, could have come in with a knife like he did on them two. He was stabbing him as soon as he went into the house. And I just everybody keeps saying, oh, you're very lucky, Alan. Perhaps I was lucky. News of the two bodies quickly spread across Derby, a city not used to violent crime, especially murder. Claire Duffin was a reporter for the local newspaper. I think people were initially very, really, really shocked and scared to learn that someone that had already killed someone had been housed so close to them, and then to find out what he'd done to two men that were well-known and well-liked in the community. They were devastated by not only the fact that these two men had died, but in, in the horrible circumstances in which they met their deaths. Derbyshire police circulated Dawson's details to neighbouring forces, fearing he could strike again. Police spent several hours, almost days, checking people that Andrew Dawson had known just to make sure there weren't any more victims. I think there were fears that there could have been more victims and they checked people that he'd come into contact with. Detectives found footage of Dawson taken on CCTV. It led the search north towards Cumbria. And before long, Dawson was spotted 
in the town of Whitehaven. He'd been drinking in a pub in the town that day and he was found by some local officers on a bench asleep. They were obviously aware of the fact that Derbyshire police wanted to speak to him um, and, and stopped him and questioned him. But Dawson wasn't hanging around. In this CCTV footage, he can be seen making a break for it and trying to swim away from the law. But with nowhere to go, Dawson comes back to dry land. The police had their man. Ominously, Dawson was carrying a bag which contained more tools of his murderous trade. He was armed with knives. It's difficult to say what Mr Dawson was going to do had he not been arrested on that particular Friday morning. Andrew Dawson was once again being questioned about committing a murder and this time he would deny any involvement. At Nottingham Crown Court in July 2011, Andrew Dawson stood trial. It was a really, really tense and quite moving court case. Obviously, his victims' families were sat there. Um, he, Dawson didn't, didn't flinch throughout the whole case. He, he came in, he sat, stared straight ahead, didn't show any, any signs of any feeling or anything, to be honest, from what I could tell. Even when there's some quite disturbing bits of the evidence being read out, he, he just stared blankly ahead or at times closed his eyes. But hours into the proceedings, the trial took a dramatic twist. Dawson had motioned to his, his defence team um, to, to go to the glass to where he was seated. Um, and then they asked the judge to put the charges to him again, at which point he pleaded guilty. He knew we had overwhelming evidence. He was going to be convicted. And if he had any form of remorse, then it was at that, that time the fact that he didn't want families to uh, be put through, which would have been a horrific trial for them. Andrew Dawson was now a convicted triple killer. The judge had no option but to add him to the list of the 46 most serious violent offenders who will never be released. We have a man here who's previously murdered, an elderly gentleman, and then carries out two further murders without motive, without any justification whatsoever. I think it's the correct decision. I think life should mean life. Brother Malley, who stood by Dawson after his first conviction for murder, felt these latest crimes were beyond forgiveness. He, he's never ever turned round to us and said, oh, I'm sorry for what I did. As many times you say to me, Mum, look, it's not your fault. He said, yeah, but I brought a monster into the world. I said, no, he didn't. You brought a kid into the world. He just went that way because he, he wanted to. As simple as that. He, he ended up on the drugs. They've warped his mind, and he's turned into the killer that he is. Just pretend you've got five kids, not six. For Eric Whitehead, the policeman who brought Dawson to justice 30 years earlier, the latest conviction confirmed his opinions of the killer. Andrew Dawson is a very wicked person. He's committed three murders, three horrible murders on defenceless people, vulnerable people. It's a total waste of human life. What price do you place on human life? I know he's known as a serial killer now, and he, he should be in there until he rots. Or like I say, they fetch the death sentence back, give me the noose, I'll put it round his neck, I'll hang him. Won't bother me. I, I, I'm losing no sleep over it. <laughs>